All right, hello. Uh, welcome everyone. Today for our outreach live stream, we are joined by Professor Jerry Thomas, uh, adjunct professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the Milwaukee School of Engineering. Uh, also has a fascinating history in his study of physics, his sojourn into industry, and then coming back as a teacher who, who has all kinds of interesting ideas about uh, combining different disciplines into uh, a holistic picture of what students need to succeed in the modern, uh, both academic, intellectual, and jobs landscape. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Professor uh, uh, Thomas for joining us. Uh, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, one of the things that uh, we got a chance to talk about at the, the Wolfram Technology Conference was your, your early interest in getting into physics. So uh, as we all know, we, students these days, we really want to have ready for being able to engage with uh, all the technologies that are around them, uh, whether or not they're going to be working in those fields or their lives are just going to be affected by these fields. So uh, could you first please tell us what got you interested in having a technical career? And then as a follow-up question that we'll get into, what, what do you think is a good way of getting students of today interested in learning about these things, even if they don't go into them full-time? Um, great question. Um, I, when I was in junior high school uh, in Los Angeles, I, uh, I wasn't going to a very good school, but I had this fantastic uh, um, math teacher who turns out uh, uh, got her degree in chemistry, but couldn't get a job in chemistry. So she ended up teaching uh, junior high school in, 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 in our, our little junior high. And uh, I showed some aptitude in mathematics and she, she encouraged me uh, uh, to follow the lead that her son had taken, which was to go to Caltech. And so it, it, when I was like the eighth or ninth grade, I was convinced I was going to go to Caltech. And um, uh, when I went to high school, I got in, uh, involved with uh, uh, a physics teacher there. And uh, he took us every Friday to lectures at Caltech. So I, I uh, at that point, I was, I was bound to determine that's where I was going to go. Um, I was asked to, uh, to um, invite uh, Richard Feynman to come to our high school physics uh, club and give a talk, which I did. So uh, that was my first exposure to uh, a really big name, although at the time I had no idea who he was. And uh, I just treated him as another guy and actually wrote a letter to him after the talk. Go ahead. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Uh, I, I want to briefly ask a follow-up question about that. So you you were actually tasked with initiating that interaction, if I yes. heard you correctly. Oh yeah, I was. I was. I had to write him a letter and and get him to come. And I was uh, I was naive. I just assumed that it was no big deal. So when he came, I thought, okay. Uh, so then I uh, he gave a, a wonderful physics talk. I, I remember the talk he uh, he. Uh, had this cylinder that rolled down an inclined plane. So he rolled the cylinder down the plane. And as it was going, he talked about the physics of it and the speed and the time. And, and everybody was talking and got really excited about it. And they were a little uh, obstreperous and boisterous, but everybody had a good time. When, when the talk was all over, uh, one of the key things they learned much later about Feynman was he always got you to think. So... Before people ask questions, he was holding the cylinder at the bottom of the inclined plane, and he let go of it, and it rolled uphill. And that was the end of his talk. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I'm hearing that you had aptitude for this topic immediately, and that got other people's attention. Was this just a topic you came to with the same sort of energy that you came to every other topic? Or was there something about the topic that made you work harder, ask more questions, be more interested? I don't know what really got me interested. I was particularly interested in mathematics to start mm -hmm. with. So anything to do with mathematics, uh, I devoured. So I, um, before I went to high school, I, I had learned a lot of things on my own, like calculus. And um, uh, so when I, uh, this was in 1960, that was a year where the Sputnik had just taken off. Sure. And the, uh, there were these programs, that, uh, special pro programs for people coming into high school 
to to more formally learn some subjects like calculus. And I got into one of those programs because of my interest. That's great. So uh, Richard Feynman comes to your high school and, and gives yeah. lectures and gets everyone excited. So what, what happens next? So, so I, I wrote him a letter apologizing for the fact that, that we had a bunch of troublesome teens. And I, I hope he was, he was okay with that. And he wrote me back a four page letter, <laughs> handwritten. And, uh, and he's, his feelings were hurt because he said the only people he wanted to talk to were troublesome teens. Nobody yes. else uh, had questions that were, were at all of interest. Um, people that were adults would always ask questions like, what does it mean to me and how much it's going to cost and all, all these irrelevant questions. Where, whereas kids ask questions like, why did the thing roll uphill? Yeah, how does it work? Why did that happen? Why did this it work? other thing happen? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they're, they're like, they were really engaged and he, and so he shared with me some stories about when he grew up and all the terrible things he did. So <laughs> I was. Uh, uh, Do you remember uh, any of them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it might not be your blend. To tell them, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Like, we'd love Maybe. to hear them if, if it is your place. But it's not. <laughs> well, well, I think he, it had something to do with dropping water balloons off of buildings and seeing what, what happened to the crowd below. Mm -hmm. Which is inherently a physics problem, at least it's beginning. Yeah. Sure. It becomes a psychology problem pretty quickly, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you get back this four page letter. Um, so then th does that solidify your interest or did, did you realize that this was actually kind of cool at that point or, or what? How, oh, how, how does... I, I, well, at this point, I was pretty clear that I was going to go to Caltech, although I, I hadn't applied and I had two or three years more of high school to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did apply and, and actually I did get in and uh, um, I actually got a chance to, to meet the uh, Feynman uh, Quite a lot. He was one of the faculty members that was very happy to come to um, the student house uh, dinners, and he would stay afterwards and uh, and you know until like one or two in the morning, just t telling us stories, depending upon what he was interested in and, and what questions we asked him. That's great. I, I want to take a moment yeah. to just give a shout out to the troublesome people. I I love that thing <laughs> that you said there. A quote that I like about science is saying the most important statement in science is not Eureka, you know, when you discover something amazing, it's, well, that makes no sense. It's the, <laughs> the moments where you discover something that challenges your previous ideas, that requires explanation. And I just love the idea that troublesome people, people who are questioning things, are so crucial mm. to highlighting those major steps in science. So thank you for, for telling me that that's a perspective that some very important other people have held. Uh, he, he had a lot of perspectives, I think, that were very useful to us, besides the fact that he would tell us stories uh, about his experience at Los Alamos building the bomb. But one of the stories I remember um, when he, uh, he would come to our, our dinners is, he brought his blue notebooks. He, had, he did all of his work in these blue notebooks. And, and he said, when you write a paper, of course, you only talk about the, the results at work and the mm -hmm. paper is very short. Mm -hmm. but, but people don't realize that there are six or eight filled blue notebooks of all the things that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, uh, one of his insights was, I, I'm trying to remember exactly the quote, but it was something like, what one fool can understand, another fool can understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. And, and, and you know, we, we, and, we often learn more from our mistakes. But, sorry, go ahead. Yes. So uh, by showing us his blue notebooks, he, he showed us that, that research was nothing special. Anybody could do it if you just took the time and energy to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great insight. So you're, you're studying physics. And at, at that point, were you pretty confident that you were going to stay working in physics or were you already starting to think uh, and explore what are the applications of the skill set, these things I'm interested in to other areas? And what I'm, what I'm alluding to a little bit that we'll, I'm, we're, we'll get into later is that you have some very interesting thoughts on game theory and things that extend beyond game theory. 
Uh, you also uh, have a, a history working in, in industry, being able to apply technical ideas to, to management. So back when you were an undergraduate or maybe like an early graduate student, were you pretty focused on physics or were these other ideas already starting to creep in a little bit? Um, I think like a lot of people that I knew in physics, um, my focus was on what I was doing and the things I was doing were of course of most interest. Mm -hmm. So it never occurred to me that I might not be doing what I was doing right then later, mm -hmm. but I had no idea what I would be doing later. So, I mean, it, whatever would evolve, would evolve. I, mm -hmm. at, at Caltech, I majored, I, I was waffling between a math major and a physics major. And um, my advisor said I should go into experimental physics. And I decided, no, I really wanted to go into theoretical physics and uh, um that's what I ended up doing, but it was a close thing, but I pretty much worked on, on my physics topics and the people that I talked with. Mm -hmm. And they weren't specifically to an area of research. It was just whatever question you got interested in, the idea was just see where it takes you. Mm -hmm. So then if I'm not mistaken, you got interested in high energy physics as sort of a focus of your, your research. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about maybe if, if there's a story to that trajectory and how, how did you get into high energy physics then? Well, I was a, um, was a graduate student at UCLA and my uh, thesis advisor uh, was Nina Byers. And um, I, I worked with a number of people mostly in the area of high energy physics. And I thought that was a pretty cool area because it was sort of the fundamental questions of what makes things work. And I, uh, now for those of us listening, like, oh, say me, who doesn't know much about high energy physics, could you define what sort of field that is? Well, uh, yeah, sure. The, people have always tried to understand how things work, you know, certainly we understand uh, pre-Newtonian physics, people looked at the stars and the planets and tried to figure out why the planets moved the way they moved. And Newton was able to figure out uh, a, a codo codified way of why they moved the way they moved. And, and that really helped people's understanding. Um, Maxwell understood light in the same way as, uh, gee, we could really understand a whole bunch of things that were kind of curiosities, but put together into a, a unified picture. And having a unified picture is, is, is kind of satisfying. I mean, it gives you mm -hmm. a, a sense of understanding things. Uh, the turn of 1900, several things happened which caused people to doubt their understanding. Uh, just before the turn of the century was a Michelson-Morley experiment and people didn't understand why the speed of light was, was uh, constant no matter which way you moved. And uh, people didn't understand uh, atomic physics phenomena. They didn't, you know, th they thought things would be billiard balls the smaller you went. And so high energy physics is, is a further investigation of, of those areas of both the uh, relative speeds of things when they get really, really fast and how things behave when they're really, really small. Thank you. And... I don't know if that helps, but that's oh, definitely you know, that's yeah, definitely yes, that that helps a lot. So uh, also, I believe there are some uh, really interesting uh, things going on around the same time that, that you were studying this. So uh, the uh, uh, super proton synchrotron at CERN was uh, commissioned in '76, and uh, there's the announcement of the discovery of neutral currents in in '73. Now, uh, was this something what, what was the energy like around that time like in the fields that sort of the, these developments are happening and also feel well, free if we skipped any important part of the story to, to back up a little well, bit too, but. well I'll back up a little bit because I, mm -hmm. I I um I decided to apply for a postdoctoral job and and uh I thought it would be cool if I could get a job at CERN because that was you know in Europe I had spent a year with my thesis advisor Nina Byers at Oxford. I had met a bunch of people, uh, including my roommate, uh, Mike Kosterwitz, who ultimately got the Nobel Prize. And uh, so I, uh, I, I just, I didn't know he was going to get a Nobel Prize, but I liked the kind of people that I talked to and the, their ideas. So I thought that would be a cool thing to apply for. And it would give me um, 
an opportunity to figure out how you apply for jobs. And unfortunately for me, I actually got the job. And I didn't actually. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your test run was the job. Yeah. And, and I had to go to the department and said, you know, I got this job, but I actually don't have a degree. <laughs> <laughs> or even a thesis topic that, that we've agreed on. So uh, he told me to play the hand I was dealt, and I did. And so I ended up going to CERN in uh, 1970. Mm-hmm. And at that time, uh, uh, they were, the energies were about uh, one tenth to one hundredth of what you needed to find interesting things. Mm-hmm. They wanted to find something called a W, and they wanted to find, they didn't really understand yet that they should be looking for a Higgs, but they they thought they could do something at the energy range that they had, which on some scale is a one. <laughs> Again, mm-hmm. so, so sometime later, they needed a scale of 100. Mm-hmm. And in 73, I think they were up to about 20 or 30. <laughs> So in, in, in terms of the experimental state of the art, there is some work to do then. Uh, I'm, I'm also curious. So what, what was the role of computation at, at that time in the history of the subject? You know, what, uh, I'm curious, what do you remember of the state of the art back then? Were you involved in that back then? Or uh, can, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, my particular expertise, because I had a good math background, was I did a lot of calculations trying to analyze data. So I did a lot of a lot of comp- computer calculations and uh, was right in the middle of uh, uh, trying to understand why they couldn't find the things they were looking for and how much more complicated the computations would necessarily have to be to actually see what they were going to do. They wanted to find the W and they they didn't have, uh, they weren't collecting enough events at at high enough energies. If you collected enough events at high enough energies, then your your electronics had to go down to nanosecond technology and your computation speeds had to go up correspondingly. And they really didn't have the computing power to do that. So Um, for the the benefit of uh, people who might be listening that uh, are unfamiliar with the, the nuts and bolts of how a particle physics experiment might work, can we back up for just a second and, and revisit that, that last statement? So we we're talking about collecting events and trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, what, what was the, the role of uh, a computer in helping to disentangle that information if we could back up and sort of uh, go over that part in a little bit more depth? All right, I will give you an analogy that I learned from Feynman, mm-hmm. okay? That, that, that uh, the f- physics experiment is like getting a guy from Mars who knows nothing about pianos and concert pianists and, and saying, we're going to study the piano by, first of all, smashing it <laughs> with, a, with like a truck. And we're mm-hmm. going to see what comes out of that, that interaction, keys, black, you know, pieces of wood. And we're going to try to reconstruct not only the piano from that, but what the guy was playing. That sounds like a hard job for starters. So uh, uh, that's a really hard job. Um, But interestingly enough, you can make an awful lot of progress. Maybe you can't figure out what they were trying to play, but you can try to reconstruct the piano. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing you correctly, your role as someone who understood computation was not only to try and reconstruct the piano, but to be able to say definitively the tools we're trying to use to reconstruct the piano and the music are insufficient. And here is why you were able to, yeah. to not just see what was happening with computers, but what would need to happen in the future. Sure. That's, that's, you know, I couldn't say it better. Great, great, great. Okay. So, uh, so you were you were interested in running Monte Carlo simulations. So uh, also briefly, can we explain for people who might be listening? So what what makes a Monte Carlo simulation different from any other simulation? Uh, I, I I taught a course in computer science at Milwaukee School of Engineering, and we mm-hmm. did a Monte Carlo simulation, which which everybody in 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 my freshman computer science uh, course could understand. Which is imagine you have a dartboard. And for some reason, you want to find the area of the dartboard by simply throwing darts at it. Mm-hmm. And so 
what you would do is you would throw the darts randomly, and some, of course, would land uh, on the on the dartboard, and some would land on the wall. And if if you imagine that the person is at least skillful enough to get most of the darts to hit the wall, then all you have to do is figure out uh, uh, what fraction hit the, the dartboard versus what fraction hit the that you threw, and that will give you the area of the dartboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's a, a rather dumb way to do it, uh, but this is two dimensions. The, the Monte Carlo simulations that I did were often in 15 or 20 or 30 dimensions. <laughs> and, and, and there was no way to compute uh, numerically what the, what the volumes were. And you needed to compute the volumes to assess the statistical relevance of the information you were catching. So mm -hmm. you threw the darts in this 15 dimensional space. You could only throw a thousand or so darts uh, because of the, the slowness of the computation, but that was still enough to give you a good idea of what the volumes were. And that would give you a, a measure of the statistical significance of what the experiment was. I think I'm starting to see the connection between troublemaking and, and science because all, all you're doing is smashing pianos and throwing darts just at a significant fraction of the speed of light instead of what, what might happen <laughs> normally. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just taking the, the, the piano smashing to, to an interesting level. <laughs> That's great. So uh, you worked uh, on computation and, and these sorts of simulations at CERN for uh, roughly a decade. Do I have that right? No, I, I actually, I spent a year at CERN and then mm -hmm. I spent a year at, uh, as a visiting professor at Helsinki, University okay. of Helsinki. And then the remaining time I spent at Argonne National Lab mm -hmm. uh, working on uh, the experiments that they did at low energy at Argonne and also analyzing the data at Fermi Lab, which the high energy experiments. Mm, okay, great. So then in terms of uh, your thinking about computation at that time, were you using, or could maybe could you describe, what was the evolution in tools that you had during that time interval? You know, was it, I, cause I can't imagine it was the same tool set at the beginning of that as it was toward the end. Well, it, it started off it with uh, some version of an IBM computer with a bunch of cards. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, and learning how to deal with the fact that when you drop your cards, you better have had them had them numbered so that you can resort them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, working with machines, where as a user of the machine, you were likely to find uh, programming errors at at the micro level of the computer itself. I mean that they didn't do maybe they there were mistakes in the way they did the arithmetic. They, they couldn't get two plus two. Some of those blue notebooks you were talking about. Yeah, so so that was where it started. Um, you, quick, quick side question about that. Do you think that we we trust our computers a little bit more these days than than was necessary to do at that time? Um, so I, I, I the answer I have to give you is, is more of an answer from Enrico Fermi. Okay. Mm -hmm. Enrico Fermi's idea of, of a physicist is that if it was correct, you could show him the answer on a blackboard. Mm -hmm. And so when whatever things, whatever we computed, we also had to have an idea of what answer we expected. And mm -hmm. therefore we, we had another independent way of judging whether the computer's computation was accurate. Mm -hmm. and, and as computers got more, got faster, we evolved our way of understanding, but didn't change Fermi's original idea that you need to know on a blackboard what the answer is supposed to be. Hmm. I'm also reminded that back to the idea of dropping your, your punch cards. I've heard of people taking a marker and drawing across the top so that you could try to quickly see if you'd misplaced the stack and, and things like this aside from having the, the numbers. But. Hmm. Uh, I was told the easiest way to do it is, is take all your cards, go to this machine that numbered them. And then if you drop your cards, you go to another machine that puts them back in the same order. <laughs> <laughs> Automation all the way down. So if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, you're saying that machines are getting more and more complicated all the time. The right. sort of analysis, the sort of work we can do is getting more and more complex. But the ideas have to say have to stay at a certain level of simplicity because we have to understand them. 
that we Correct. have to be able to come back to the blackboard yeah. no matter what. So uh, one of the, pro the things that we tried to discover when I was at CERN was the W. And uh, we, we generated a certain number of events. Well, when the W was found, if I remember correctly, it took 10 to the 15th events. But in order to keep it at this level of understanding at the blackboard, the way they did the experiment was they threw out electronically those events that couldn't possibly be the W. Mm -hmm. so, so you didn't have to understand why you threw it out. You just know that what you can't, that, that, that there was something wrong with them that you wouldn't be able to make a, a judgment. Mm -hmm. And then you could write a program that would, uh, that, that would drop the number of events to, down to about a million. Mm. And then you could write a program, which at that time, it took about a month to run, that would throw out all the events, again, that you might have some question marks about that you wouldn't understand. And so the final number of events that they had to understand was about 12. <laughs> and, and for that, they, they got their best physicist in a room and, and said, okay, go to it. Tell us whether you think these events really are or are not. Now, in this in this strategy for being able to take a complicated, messy thing and distill down what's the information that's noise, what's the signal, do you think that was already starting to, to give you ideas about strategy and uh, what eventually became interest in, in game theory and beyond, or is that still a later part of the story? I, I think that's that has always been part of the same story. But, okay. Uh, 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 my, under, my, my interest in game theory was the thought that, hey, this is the same kind of problem that I'm used to dealing with in physics. Mm -hmm. uh, now, sorry, uh, when you say the same, same problem, do you mean at the sort of formal mathematical level? Do you mean conceptually? Can you flesh out for people? What, what do you mean by the same problem? Well, first of all, it's an interesting problem. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people that play games, of course, are... Uh, 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 children's games, but I, I at one point I, I took the time to read uh, a book by von Neumann and Morgenstern on game theory, and I was interested in in the way the book was written because it was written not just for economists but for physicists. Mm. And what he did was a very physics thing, which is he said, "Let's take a children's game." Let's analyze the idea of the game in, as a toy model. Now let's take a step back and say, uh, how does this generalize to other kinds of interactions? And say, you know, this really could be a subject that talks not just about children's games, but any type of economic interaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, so, so, go ahead. And, and he said, and, and just like in physics, there are things that you can measure. He said, there are some things that you can measure here which are, uh, can be codified in terms of numbers. Uh, it won't be a scattering matrix like in physics, but it will be a matrix of some sort that has numbers in it. And he said, these, these matrices will have certain properties which are interesting to investigate. And did you also immediately start to see the application of computation there? Or so in other words, were all of these areas jumbled in all at once in your mind or, or was it? you know, maybe two coming together first of physics and game theory and then computation later? Or was your understanding of physics all already so so tied to your understanding of computation that they came in as one? They really came as one. I use computation as a way of, of solidifying ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if somebody tells you that uh, there's a certain property and they just tell it, tell it to you, you, mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, you go, okay, that's interesting. But it's not really interesting until you can tell, say why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I remember there was a student of Feynman's, uh, it, it, an apocryphal story. I'm not sure it's true. But they were asked to give a Blackboard presentation of why is the sky blue? And they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. and what they were supposed to do was actually compute the rate at which light would scatter as a function of frequency and realize that the scattering for blue would be larger and 
actually come up with a number and from that number figure out that this guy would have to be blue because of, of the way the numbers came out. Mm. So, so that's an example of a computation that you can in principle do on a, a blackboard. Um, yes. So in, in your mind, computation that you do using a, a tool like a machine is sort of an extension of that that allows you to be more efficient and faster. Is that, is that the way you think of it or am I, am I putting words in your mouth there? Uh, I, I, I think physicists are willing to use any machine that they trust. Mm. Okay. Um, at some point, the only machine they trusted, for example, might have been a slide rule. That's the way I was brought up. <laughs> but a slide rule, of course, is a computational machine. You trust sure. that the uh, you you trust that, that the heat and humidity won't change the dimensions of the slide rule significantly, uh, and, and so you you learn to trust that. Um, uh, once you have uh, calculators, you trust them because you verified that they in all cases give answers and the probability of them giving a wrong answer is so small as to not be worthy of, of discussion. Mm -hmm. So in this analogy, it sort of sounds like the computer, all of the data it gathers, analysis it does, is like the blue sky that you can yeah. look at and say, well, there it is. Things are this way. But the big question of why, though, why is this actually the way it is, is something that comes down to a blackboard sort of thinking. These days, that sort of thinking may be done literally on a computer, but that is a fundamental difference in thinking between all that evidence gathering and the, the more personal analysis. Am I hearing that right? Yeah, well, um... You're, you're espousing a view which which I also saw uh, from an MIT group on systems dynamics, which is in business, people often wave their hands. Even though they think they're at a blackboard, they simply stand up and wave their hands about what might be true. Mm -hmm. But but it's not based on facts. There, there's nothing you can put your finger on. Um, doing a computation where you actually need to compute how long it will take to deliver a product Mm -hmm. and, and and getting that number correct. And if it doesn't come out correct, being able to identify where in your assumption uh, you made a mistake. That level of understanding facts requires computation. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's an interesting segue here because so you, you spent uh, a good deal of time at Argonne National Lab working on uh, computational problems related to physics, but at some point you you also got interested in engineering and in in those exact sorts of problems of figuring out how much resources do you have to allocate in order to you know solve a particular uh, project uh, related problem. So how did how did that shift come about? Well, I just I, um, at some point I decided that uh, um, I wasn't going to get a Nobel Prize in physics and. Uh, um, I, I, I definitely uh, enjoyed the computational aspect. Um, I had worked at Argonne on, on some things that involved fast computing from supercomputers. Um, I remember we had a visitor program where we invited Steve Wolfram to come. And uh, he, was, he told us about this, this wonderful new program called Mathematica. And we knew about the program uh, out on the East Coast called Symbolica. And we said, oh yeah, this is the same thing. So his runs on a laptop, a personal computer, and the other thing runs on a supercomputer. But uh, so I was definitely interested in com computation and, and a number of physicists had gone from Argonne to Bell Labs, which was sort of down the road. And I did, yeah. So I, a bunch of my friends were there. So I decided, okay, maybe I, I'll, I'll see what these guys do. Mm -hmm. And um one of the things they do to you, especially if you have a PhD, and especially a PhD in physics, is uh, they absolutely don't trust you. They, they, <laughs> they think, <laughs> they, they, think that, that. They, they think that you're, you're, you're kind of weird and you're going to be stuck up and you're going to tell everybody what to do because you know a lot. <laughs> so I, I was told to uh, carry a spear, keep my head down, just do what they told me. If it was program something in the assembler, if it was to manage a project, okay, whatever it is, just do that. Well, 
okay, I did that, but I couldn't stop the way I think. <laughs> so obviously I got it, you know, when I did uh, one of the jobs they thought I uh, could do without getting into trouble was simply being a project manager. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, so I managed a project for um, uh, a, uh, People telephone switchboard computing uh, uh, computing programs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, so I learned a lot about project management. And oh, by the way, I learned that you know there were some similarities in project management in differential equations, which was kind of interesting. And um, in an optimization I, sort of sense. Uh, no, I, I actually just the opposite. I, I had a very poor opinion of the people in the optimization group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason was, was, was uh, we had a project that involved about 200 people that had been working on it for a period of five or five years. And our, our customer was, was a big customer uh, uh, in, in Chicago. And uh, we promised them a delivery date. And at one point they said, hey, that's great, but we it's taking so long to get to this point. We, we have some new requirements. Could you add them? So they, we said yes. And that was our, our, our optimization group. They looked at the optimization problem and they computed based on probability uh, what they thought, you know, that this would be okay. And uh, the end result was we were two years late delivering the, that project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not the ideal so, outcome there. So, uh, but uh, the group I was in had kind of the same mindset that I do, which is a sort of a physics mindset. The question was, why did that happen? So we hired a, a consultant uh, out of uh, out of MIT that did systems dynamics, and they went through and did a sort of a, a differential equation analysis uh, of a cause and effect of what ha actually happened. Mm. Wow. And... That really told me that what I was dealing with in in industry, the things that I was interested in and how things work, was just like the kinds of things that I was used to dealing with in physics. Mm -hmm. You know, rates of change, how you know, interactions, how things work. It wasn't obvious that they had anything to do with game theory at this point, but ultimately it occurred to me that yeah, probably it does have a lot to do with game theory. So you were taking your same analytical way of thinking about things and a similar sort of a toolkit for, you know, what, what can I measure? What are inputs, outputs, things like this? Right. What are the relations between things? And due to necessity of be, being in a new situation and, and seeing how these things were playing out right in front of you, you started to think about how, how can this way of thinking help make the results of this process better? Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I was paid to do that. I was in a group and that we were, ultimately, we, we since we were a success with our dis discovery of why the project was late, uh, uh, it made an impact. Uh, they changed the way that the, the projects were managed. Uh, we, get, we told them the answer in a simple way on a blackboard mm -hmm. that, that anybody could understand. We said, hey, it's, it's no big deal. You brought people in who didn't know anything about the domain they were coding in so that the number of errors they created was was uh, significantly bigger and therefore the testing intervals uh, uh, they had to go through more testing intervals and since each testing interval was six months and it took four more testing intervals that's two years mm. this may be a silly question um, but I know there are some people who don't bring their jobs home at all like chefs who only eat a cheese sandwich at home because they're tired of cooking. So I wanted to ask, do you think the way that you think about things mathematically, scientifically, uh, in terms of game theory, in terms of probability and change, affects the way you look at your everyday life? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, I think, um, you know, going back to my interactions with Feynman, the way he interacted with us, the way he did physics, he was the same guy always. And that, mm -hmm. and that's, that was, uh, he, whatever he did, he got totally engaged with. And he tried to understand that um, to the best of his ability, bringing you know, all the things that might be relevant. And I would say um, what makes life interesting for me, at least, 
is to bring the same intensity, the same thought process to everything I do. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. really draw a line between, uh, but it, I, I would probably turn it around and say, I, I enjoy what I'm doing and occasionally they, they pay me for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of looking at things. So uh, when you are speaking, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but when you're speaking with students, uh, people who are either thinking about going into business, people who are thinking about going into engineering or people who are thinking about going into all kinds of things, what, what advice do you give them for the way that you would recommend they think about these different areas of the sort of, uh, which are some, occasionally, I think, uh, not to the benefit of the end result. So sometimes people think of like management and that the technical things is different, but they're really not, I think, in, in all of our opinions here. So what, what, what advice would you give to students who are maybe being told, oh, you should study this or study that, and they think, well, maybe both are relevant. What, what would you say for, for a student like that? Uh, okay, I, I suppose I, I, I hope nobody from my school is listening. <laughs> oh, but um, uh, one of the things I learned at Bell Laboratories is the people that we hired uh, to do the job were from physics, biology, chemistry, uh, computer science, electrical engineering. The thing that they all had in common was their ability to understand and to think and how to solve problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so one of the things they asked me to do early on, because I could do that, was uh, uh, they said, there's this new organization that does accreditation for programs. Why don't you join it? It's called Computer Science Accreditation Board. And uh, because we could hire people that come from an accredited program, if you can convince them that the skills that we're looking for are the skills that they uh put down on their uh, list of accreditation criteria. Mm. So I started that in like in the eighties and I'm still doing accreditation work now for ABET. And, Mm. um, and the, the, um, I'm currently on their commission as a team chair. And what I, what we do in looking for programs is making sure the programs teach students how to think, Mm -hmm. which is different from being, uh, a um, we 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 hope they have skill sets in their domain, but the ability to think is a lot more important. Is what I learned from Bell Labs than what domain they came from. Hmm. So, so so to this, summarize, oh, sorry. So this is kind of to go the answer to your question is what I tell my students is I hope I'm teaching you how to think. I can't guarantee what what field you're going to go into even if it's the one you want to go into and you think you're going to be a success, you probably won't stay there for more than five or 10 years. That the field may disappear. Yeah. You know, I, in fact, I just, I, I, I talked to students this last week and I said, okay, you guys are all learning Java and computer programming and software design uh, as if that's going to be the thing. Uh, quantum computing is probably not going to work that way. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if you're going to get a job in quantum computing, I hope you learn how to think, how to think, as opposed to say coming with a skill set that says I know how to 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 program in this Java language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there, there's there's two forks in the road here in the conversation that I want to follow both of them on. So one one fork has to do with you know learning outcomes in your courses, and the other fork is is about what other experience you've had working in industry because you 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 had this initial experience of coming into industry, realizing that the game theory and strategy and, and analytical thinking that you already had some background in was relevant to having good outcomes for the projects that you were managing. So uh, what other might there be to say about that period when you were working in industry and thinking about these ideas related to, to game theory and how to, to use some of these ideas to have better outcomes? So I I left um, uh, Bell Labs and I went to Motorola. And I, I at Motorola I ended up managing um, a, a lot of groups, I, like a hundred people in four different countries. And uh, as a manager, I was focused more on strategy 
than the tactics of actually writing code. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one problem that I specifically remember that might have pushed me towards game theory was Motor Motorola had a particular problem at the time, which is it had 12 divisions, which were called sometimes internally the warring tribes. And, and, and each division was the size of, of a major company. I mean, these were not, you know, uh, there was an infrastructure group uh, division and there was a cellular device division and an automotive division. And uh, I was tasked to be part of a group to decide whether or not to get rid of one of the divisions. Mm. So, and, okay, sorry, go ahead. Certainly a relevant conversation these days where yeah. so many tech places are making so many deep cuts. And, and what I was struck was this is a complex thing because each division was huge. Mm -hmm. And the in the end, the analysis boiled down we could summarize it again as a chalk talk on a board. Are we selling razors or razor blades? Mm -hmm. uh, a division that sells uh, razors is in the infrastructure business. One that sells blades is the is a commodity. Mm -hmm. And those are two very different businesses. And you have to decide which are you um, most suited to be. And if mm -hmm. you are a company that's been around for 50 or 100 years, you might very well have enough patents and so on to be in the infrastructure business. Whereas there were companies like uh, Nokia that were eating our lunch and, you know, out of Finland. And I lived in Finland and I, these are little, the, the whole comp population of fin Finland was like 5 million. Mm -hmm. And how could that little country be, beat us on selling cellular uh, cell phones? Well, they're small, agile. Also, the education system in, in Finland is widely held up and studied as a, a good example for uh, other places to emulate. Um, but so, yeah, we'll, we'll get into talking about education as well. But, but so, in, but in this yeah. case, it was primarily the fact of just being small and agile. That, mm -hmm. like, uh, and, and, and it said, OK, uh, what's at, at play here, if you take away all the stuff, is the same thought process that goes on in physics and the same thought process I saw uh, in, in uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern's book, which is how you um, isolate the basic ideas mm -hmm. in, 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 to what the what are the operating principles. From that, you get a theory. Mm -hmm. and now, there, there's two things that I uh, want to ask about. So one is for the audience, sort of what you would consider um, is there sort of a, a boundary between game theory and decision process theory, uh, if you could try to help spell that out? And then the other question, which is related to that, is when you were thinking of, of applying these game theoretic ideas to the real situations you were finding yourself in, was there a point that you remember thinking, I need to do something that isn't just game theory? Or was it always kind of bringing in ideas from game theory, but not quite that from the beginning? Um, I don't know if I have a real good answer for that. I go mm -hmm. back to the book that I read from von Neumann mm -hmm. and he, he articulated the idea which stuck with me, which is game theory is like doing statics in physics. Mm -hmm. And it's not everything to do with decisions, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. And he suggested at some point, somebody's going to have to be able to do, to go beyond statics and do dynamics. Mm -hmm. And to, to remind people who might be listening, when you're when you're solving problems involving statics, this is where the objects are not moving, and you're sort of analyzing yeah. what's the case where everything is frozen in place. It might still be interesting. You want your actually you don't want your bridge to be totally static, but that that's a that's a side thing. You you might imagine you want a bridge to be static. Well, but yeah, dynamics yeah. is actually an interesting thing. Well, I, the the example I would give in, in a physics course is you walk across the bridge. First mm -hmm. of all, if you walk across as, and as a three-year-old, you're very light and your weight compared to the structure of the bridge is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And that's static. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have an army marching across in step, mm -hmm. uh, the bridge might start resonating. And if it resonates, it actually could start a resonant phenomena and collapse, which many bridges do. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, so uh, the first step in understanding is what allows the bridge to be constructed that will be okay for the three-year-old walking across. Mm -hmm. and, and someone who only has an idea of the static approach might look at their three-year-old analysis and say, humans don't affect the bridge. A person Correct. cannot impact the bridge, therefore we don't have to worry about the army and be very wrong. And be very wrong. And uh, what I thought was fascinating about von Neumann is he understood that distinction. Mm -hmm. And um, when I looked more carefully at what he had done at the, at the mathematics, I could see there was actually a connection of the mathematics that he was doing and some physics mathematics. Mm -hmm. And that physics analogy uh, or a mathematics an analogy said, here's a way to extend his static approach to dynamics. Hmm. So to, to summarize, thinking you were always sort of thinking about these problems in the statics versus dynamics, uh, not duality, but in the sense that there are these two different regimes of the problem. And so you have to yeah. think about that, that. Yeah, I would say that the static approach of game theory was kind of like the statistical approach. And I understood the value of that. Mm -hmm. The dynamic approach is what I saw as evidence from the systems dynamics approach, which had led us to understanding of our, our uh, uh, problem of being two years late. That mm -hmm. all had to do with the dynamics. Um, John, I heard you had a second question, but mm. I have something Please I think might be relevant here. Um, just hearing you talk about the different ways of approaching these issues and remembering what you said about teaching students that the most important thing is to learn how to think. Yes. I find myself wondering, do you believe that people who learn computational physics or computational game theory or whatever, computational X where their field is X, have learned to think differently than others, than, than people who haven't? Um, I, my answer is funny, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I, the, the reason it's funny is because I'm trying to teach uh, object-oriented design currently. That's the my course that I'm tasked with. Object-oriented design. And, mm -hmm. uh, when I was at Bell Labs, I was tasked with moving our uh, groups um, from doing assembler program and C programming to object-oriented programming, C++ at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a talk that was given by Brady Booch, who was a famous guy on object-oriented design. And uh, the people in the audience who were good programmers uh, were lost. And the people in the audience who had no programming ability at all, but were the um, electrical engineers that had built the switching systems, said, what he's saying makes perfect sense. This is what we've been trying to tell you all along. Hmm. That's, so, that's fascinating. So Do you think my, there's my, something about uh, the problems that electrical engineers have been working on that lent, lent themselves to that? Just as a quick side question. I think it's that the, the electrical engineers were you were dealing in the real world domain mm -hmm. and, and were grounded. So they were essentially giving the chalk talk all the time to themselves. Mm -hmm. And that the uh, that many of the programmers were artisans. They, they 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 learned a set of tools, but they hadn't learned how to think. Interesting. So you would emphasize to students who are in whatever field learning, whatever programming language and whatever class for whatever purposes, that you want to not just become an expert in whatever you know, tool you have to be working with, but the, the really important thing is that you learn to think so that you can apply any tool. Is, is that a, yeah. a good piece? Okay. Yeah, I, I went to Florida in a startup and I remember um, we, were, we had 10 people in the group and we were programming something, a new product, uh, in C++, and I said, you know, uh, I think that Java would be a much better language to do this. Why do you guys learn Java over the weekend and redo the program? And they did, mm -hmm. because they they understood the language was not a problem to them. They, they understood what the language would do for them. Mm. 
Now, in in one of your courses that that uh, you have taught, you have uh, an interesting combination of things. You have game theory, strategic thinking, uh, and analyzing decisions, and Wolfram language, all as sort of learning goals in a in a course. So, yeah. <laughs> so can, can you talk a little bit about the, the genesis of uh, that combination of things being something that you wanted to teach students? Well, I wanted to teach them uh, uh, the ideas of game theory and strategic thinking, but they needed the tools in order to understand or appreciate the game theory I wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted a language to do the computation that would not get them bogged down in the computational aspect. Mm -hmm. So for example, if somebody uh, needs to take the square root of two, I don't want them to worry about how to do it by hand. Right. Uh, and, and the Wolfram language uh, takes that to the nth degree. It says, oh, you want to solve a differential equation? Well, you this is what you do as an input. And I had uh, experienced that teaching a course in electromagnetic fields where my students were not very good at the, um, at the calculus in the calculation part. And I said, so why don't you just frame the problem that you're trying to solve? What are the initial conditions and what equations apply? And here's a little from language that you could then use to show what the fields would look like. Mm -hmm. And they would, oh yeah, this is cool. And they got it. Yeah. Now, it, here's an interesting thing that I want to get, get your take on. So a lot of uh, thought in the education sphere, uh, I, I taught at the K-12 level for a number of years before coming to Wolfram Research. And uh, one of the, the things which gets ta talked a lot about is that exact framing of the problem, right? How we, a lot of times, you know, research has shown that we spend too much time teaching particular algorithms for how to solve a problem and not enough time spent on how to frame problems in an effective way. Right. right. Now, there's, I think there's a couple interesting things to say about this. So, so for one, I'm curious about your whole take on that. And also, what do you think it is that, that causes the disconnect between some education and practice where that, that idea has been around education for a long time, but some somehow algorithms still get focused maybe a little bit too much and especially in the K-12 domain or let's say early uh, undergrad. Yeah, um, I know that there are really different ways to teach. Um, uh, schools have, have a lot of constraints on them mm -hmm. uh, to leave no child behind, to make sure that everybody gets something out of school. Mm -hmm. um, probably the way I uh, am most comfortable would leave some people behind. It, I mean, that, that is an interesting thing to keep in mind, but I, I think a lot of both anecdotal and if I'm not mistaken, there, there has been some, some studies as well that show that actually the, the framing of the problem tends to be a much more approachable way of thinking about things that are, you know, because a lot of the algorithms that people associate with doing math and, and being technical, like that's the hard part. And actually, if you sort of free yourself from thinking about, okay, what are the, the details of implementing some random algorithm? and actually think about framing the problem, that, that that actually is a more accessible way of thinking about technical things. I I absolutely agree with you. And I will give you an example, again, from Feynman, okay? Mm -hmm. Feynman thought that that uh, it would be, uh, he said, any, any fool can learn this. Mm -hmm. And he said, this must apply to quantum electrodynamics, which is one of the more sophisticated theories out there. Mm -hmm. So he set aside the goal and he wrote a book on it called QED. And the hmm. goal was to teach quantum electrodynamics to first year uh, art students. Wonderful. And he said, I'm going to teach you how it works and the ideas. You're not going to be able to compute things with it, but I'm, you are going to understand it. I'm not going to leave anything out. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a wonderful book. And, and, I, you know, it's the kind of book that I would read to study for my, my uh, oral exams for a PhD because it's actually correct. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that because the Wolfram language puts more emphasis, sorry, puts less 
emphasis on what's going on under the hood of the program that it gives you a way of finding solutions without having to specifically code exactly what step the computer is doing every time, that it lets people focus on the ideas, like these art students. That yes. is, that's yeah. beautiful. And, and if you can frame the problem, like in game theory, if you can frame the problem in game theory uh, with a, sophist a sufficiently sophisticated notebook, mm -hmm. I should be able to run the notebook and have it tell you what is the result of, of your framed problem. Mm. And that's basically, that's the book that I've been writing with Wolfram, which is to create the, uh, that, that toolkit. Mm -hmm. And the course that I teach is to teach people the basic ideas of the Wolfram language of how to frame questions. And I start with framing questions of, uh, um, yeah, uh, AI things, uh, uh, how to compute solutions to equations, whatever, until they get used to the idea of framing. And that takes a week. Mm -hmm. And then, then I have to frame, say, here's how, how can you frame a problem in, game theory, that takes a week or two. Now, uh, can, can you speak to, so when people are, are thinking about how to frame these problems, uh, so in, and you, you mentioned, so you have uh, a collaboration with Wolfram Media to uh, have uh, books on decision process theory, which is a yeah. way of thinking about these strategic problems that arise that are the dynamic version of right. you know, what might be a static game theory problem. So, can you speak to that, that role of how do you think about framing problems or how do you think about teaching people to frame problems instead of worrying about some of the minutia of a particular algorithm? Um, so I, I, I should tell you a little bit about the makeup of the classes I've had. I've had electrical engineering students, uh, computer engineering students, computer science students, software engineering students, and business students. Mm -hmm. and, my approach to them is the same, which is I try to teach them the basic ideas at the level of a sixth grader, which I, this is what I learned from Bell Labs. It's always drop the level down so that everybody, to a common denominator, so everybody understands the ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them to frame a problem in their domain using the tools that they've learned. So I don't have to teach them the, the domain level. They they will pick whatever problem they like. <laughs> and then I will uh, s s judge whether they got it or not, depending upon whether they actually frame their problem correctly. <laughs> hmm. it, it's interesting to hear you say that because this is another thing which tends to help build engagement with students and make all subjects more accessible is making whatever, uh, whatever your studying relevant to the students' lives. So you encourage people to bring their own problems to this toolkit and then learn how to apply the toolkit to their yeah. problem. Yeah, so my computer science, they'll bring a Pokemon example. Mm -hmm. Sure, a lot of math uh, involved in a lot of those games. Yeah. Uh, then uh, then I have other students, uh, software engineers, they say, oh yeah, the, these massive games that people do online, they will bring those games. Uh, hmm. I have you know, electrical or computer engineering students, and they say, well, I've been working on this project on, on power consumption, and they'll try to bring that problem. Mm -hmm. That's great. So uh, when we get a chance to speak before, you were talking about how you've been really trying to bring this interdisciplinary approach to education, which is similar to the trajectory that you had bringing you to the point where, where you're teaching. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the challenges that come up when trying to have a truly interdisciplinary approach to education? And if I could throw in the question, what does an interdisciplinary approach to education mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I'll start with that one. It means that there are no silos. Mm -hmm. That, that um, the guy that I shared my office with at Oxford, uh, Mike Kosterlitz, uh, I remember somebody asking him, he was, he got his degree at Oxford as an undergraduate. And so somebody asked him, uh, he, he asked the question how to do uh, linear algebra. And uh, people from the, the state said, didn't you learn that as an undergraduate? He says, no, we don't learn that. 
Mm-hmm. Just learn how to learn. Mm-hmm. And so he picked it up in a couple of weeks. So, so- I, I don't think, I, I think the challenge is um, learning outcomes usually means a, a skill set at the end of 10 weeks or 20 weeks, whatever the, the, the period mm-hmm. is, right? Yes, especially a testable one. A testable one. And uh, my, my, my friend at Oxford, his testable challenge was his reader. I mean, he would have to go talk to his reader and, and, and explain what he learned. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he had the ability to learn that he could read something and come back with some good questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one, one common finding is that a lot of time when you're teaching, especially younger students, how to have that thinking process and the analytical thinking, you'll often see the outcomes follow an exponential that has a slightly lower leading order term than if you do the sort of more siloed rote learning approach. And so depending on when you're, when you're testing, right, if you don't have long-term benefits in mind, you know, there can sometimes be that perverse incentive there to emphasize, oh yeah, well, if I just teach it this way, I'll, I'll get the, the higher leading order term because after 10 weeks, right, that, that's, that's what I'm testing. But you, you, you would, what would your, what would some of your arguments be for not doing that, for keeping the, the longer term trajectory in, in mind? So um, I, my daughter, when she was very young, uh, went to Montessori school. Mm. And I, the, the, oh, it's, not true of, uh, it's not true of all Montessori schools, but it was true of this school, which is there was no set pattern of what they were supposed to learn. Mm-hmm. And you started at the age of two. Mm-hmm. Um, what they did is they would... Uh, as parents, we were told what they hoped the students would learn out of this, and they explained how they had set the environment up in such a way that when things happen, learning would happen. And as an example, if a student, the student was asked to say, uh, pour some, uh, take a pitcher of water, uh, pour a glass of water, and bring the pitcher and the glass to a table. So what happens if the pitcher and the glass, everything crashes on the floor, sure. which is which is certainly going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So this is where the, the difference happens, I think, in teaching. Uh, in, in this environment, they said, okay, at this point, the, the, the Montessori teacher will, will say, hmm, how do we clean this up? And we'll go get a dustbin and a broom. And we'll show the student how to sweep up all the shards of glass, right? Mm-hmm. And you say, okay, so you're cleaning up a mess. No, no, no. They say, we're not cleaning up a mess. We're going to show them how to write. How are you going to show them how to write? Because when we when they sweep, they're going to have to do swirling motions with their arm, which are large motor skills, which ultimately they're going to refine to small motor skills, which will ultimately be the, the, the precursor to learning how to write. And they're also learning in my thinking, the lesson you learned when you saw those blue notebooks to say mistakes, bad outcomes, even damage can be part of learning, that it's Correct. part of the process. Right. And, and the, the key here is not to raise a flag to the, kid, the student that says you've made a mistake. Hmm. Okay, and uh, I thought this was a Montessori lesson until I went to a management course, and I found out that that the um, the trick to becoming a better manager was learning that mistakes are a Western conception, not a universal conception, and that mistakes hmm. are an opportunity to learn what's missing, and hence are the what helps you go mm-hmm. forward, and. Uh, And I think when I tell this part of the story, I always quote Winston Churchill, which he said, what is the definition of success? It's the the ability to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I have thought about that, but we have a question from the audience that seemed particularly relevant to this conversation, which is, what are some ways to integrate Wolfram Tech into the classroom? I'm wondering if any of these ideas that you've been discussing 
about freedom in education, about letting people find their own ways are related to how you use Wolfram um, technology in the classroom. I, I suppose I would, I would want to ask a little bit about what, you know, are we talking about college or high school or, 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 or yeah. preschool? So, so the, the more general question in that specific one is also, so how do you take that very carefully designed environment with a lot of opportunities for learning, which is very expertly crafted at, at schools of that, that nature, how do you apply those ideas at a college classroom, which uh, is, is often on a you know, X number of week time schedule, there's other various constraints depending on institution and whatnot. So how, how, how do you take that attitude and implement it at higher education, would you say? I, I will tell you one, th uh, different things that I've tried. I, I, when I first uh, started teaching at the college level, I didn't know anything about the rules, about what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, I had a freshman class in circuits. And I, you know, I, why I got to teach circuits was because the guy who normally taught it was, not, was on sabbatical. So, okay, I'll teach a class on circuits. And I thought it was kind of interesting because I didn't know anything about circuits. So I was going to learn about circuits too. Um, but I wanted to bring my ideas from industry to this class. So not knowing that this was a no-no, I said, well, you know, after five or six weeks, you've done some circuits. I now want you to do a, a project of your own devising. Mm -hmm. You come up with your own project and you t uh, you're going to write a contract with me. And, and the rules are, you write the contract. I can put my thumbs up or thumbs down on it. But if I say thumbs up, then you'll get a grade based solely on whether you met the contract. So I had uh, students in the class who were uh, exceedingly clever in electrical engineering and students in the class that were uh, had no clue about electrical engineering, but they all liked to, to do this project and every one of them learned something from it. And in fact, did what I would have hoped from, in a Montessori environment, which mm -hmm. is at their level, they were able to take the tools and techniques that they had learned in circuits and put it together into a project and deliver the project that they had agreed they were accountable for. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, it sounds like you've, you've implemented differentiated instruction at the higher education level, which is something which I think everybody would, would want as an outcome in principle. But you also mentioned that there was some part of that process which was a no-no to do. So if, if you can talk about maybe, so what, what, what part of that didn't, didn't uh, quite fit with whatever constraints you were working with? Oh, I was told that, that you can't give students at the freshman level a, a open-ended project. Mm -hmm. hmm. That they need to be at least seniors. Hmm. That's unfortunate for, uh, you know, freshmen that, that uh, aren't allowed to, to work on those things, because I think it's a great way yeah. to learn. Well, I, you know, I just, you know, I, of, of course, I, I remember um, my experience at Caltech, which was, uh, uh, we, I, we had a physics lab, and our physics, our first physics experiment was to measure the length of a room with any device we wanted. And then our second physics experiment was anything we wanted. Hmm. Do, do you recall, what, what did you decide to do for your, you know, uh, wild card pick it, pick your, pick your. Oh, I, I, well, I, one experiment I did was uh, we measured the length of the distance between a doorknob and the top of a building. Hmm. It's a fascinating. Uh, a problems. specific building or like uh, so yeah it was no a very specific yeah, very specific building and so he had to do some some geometry and trigonometry to, to, mm -hmm. to make that happen um <laughs> another experiment that i did was we had this um uh building that had like seven floor basements so it had huge drop from floor zero to the bottom so my experiment was to drop ping pong balls down and see what the what happened what their speed was mm. That's great. We, we have another question here I see uh, that I'll split into a, a two questions. So the, the original question is, what, what's your advice for newcomers into uh, industry? And then the other part that I want to ask is, what, what's your 
advice for uh, students who are new into university? Because you have experience teaching undergraduates. So if, if we could kind of take those two groups, people just stepping into or just stepping out of university, what, what would some good the advice be? The question was about physics specifically, mm -hmm. but I think any sort of insight you have into this is going to be valuable. So, uh, so restate the question. It, it, what would it for industry or for physics? I'm not sure I got which one. Uh, which of yeah, so the, the original question was what's advice for newcomers with a physics background coming into industry, I think is how I interpret oh, the question. Okay. Oh, and, oh, and, and I got then it. Yep. The, the more general question is just for people coming out of uh, their undergraduate education industry, what would your advice be? So the advice I was given, and I have no reason to, to change it, is the first thing you do in industry is, is forget everything you know about physics and, and see what it is they want, uh, they need doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, if, if you are as good in physics as you think you are, that physics background will ultimately come and help you. But first you have to convince them that, that you, uh, industry doesn't really care about your ability to do research. They care about your ability to deliver. Mm. And, and your ability to fit into the organization and learn what the organization's values and, and uh, um, uh, its mission is. And so then what would your advice be to people who are just stepping into university would be a, not quite the question that was asked, but a relevant extension that I think. So people um, who are coming from that transition high school into higher education. So they, if they're coming from uh, in other words, if they're coming in as a high school student into as into as a student in, in university yep. or as a faculty member, as a student, as a student, yeah. Um, probably the most important thing, in a way, is life is supposed to be fun. Mm. If you make if you make university something that is a job, uh, uh, you probably wasted your time because soon enough you're going to be out in industry and have to get a real job. So, uh, but what I mean by fun is more, um, it's not fun in the sense of just fritting your time away, but being open to new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, being open to exploring, taking the time to explore new ideas. Um, being willing to, um, let's see. I mean, I had a student to take one of my courses and she did very badly, but she wrote me a nice note saying that, that she actually learned something. And I remember that from some of the courses I took. Some of the courses I did really terrible at were courses that I really enjoyed and learned mm -hmm. a lot from because I took the time to learn and she took the time to learn what was being taught, even though at the technical level, maybe she, or she didn't have the time or, or, or wish to, to do the work in some of the projects, but it doesn't mean that she didn't learn lots. Hmm. So uh, we, we briefly talked a little about some of the, the challenges of, of having an interdisciplinary approach to what you're studying, not having silos and things like this. Um, were there other, uh, were there any other challenges, excuse me, any other challenges worth mentioning in that area when you're trying to have this very broad based, you know, bring whatever project is relevant to you approach? Um, I'll tell you another thing that I learned from industry is the ability to listen. And so I think to be interdisciplinary means as a teacher, you have to listen to your students to find out where they're really at, what they really know, and what their interests really are, as opposed to you telling them what they're supposed to know and what they're going to learn. Hmm. I mean, it's a little bit like the job of a thesis advisor, you know, for a doctoral student, which is not to tell the doctoral student what to do, but to, to find out what the doctoral student is interested in doing <laughs> And, and seeing if there's a match between that and something that is could be applied to an interesting problem. We we just had uh, another question come in uh, about you know 
can the same sort of approach work? This isn't the exact question I'm paraphrasing, but can the same sort of approach work at a younger age range too? What, what advice or experience do you have in, in trying to cultivate a, the, ability, the ability to think really in younger students so that then by the time they get to the age that they're interested in university or whatever they're interested in, that they, they bring that ability to think and that excitement for learning with them? I, I went to a conference at uh, a complexity conference mm-hmm. um, and uh, listened to a talk where they had, they were teaching third graders systems dynamics and how to solve the differential equations. So I said, really? They says, yeah. So I said, how are you doing that? Well, uh, we're not going to solve differential equations, but we're going to show them how things are interconnected because they have phones and they're going to be able to talk to each other and they're going to be in a room and person A is going to call person B and person B can call person C and they can see how that interaction goes. And they were able to simulate fairly sophisticated systems that the students could understand because they could see it. Wonderful. Wow. So and, did, did they also have, because uh, I'm, I'm curious for that age range, did they also have that sort of visualization and simulation built in at, at the sort of uh, formal level as well? Or Yeah. Yeah, I, well, they, they did. And I, I will give you another example because uh, it, it reminds me. Um, one of the problems Bell Labs had was uh, uh, the competing problems were hard for, for the, uh, the accounting group, right? Because they, they, the accounting program would charge people money for uh, the phone calls. But on Mother's Day, they would want to make special rates. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the, the people who did accounting weren't programmers and they couldn't so they would have to farm out the pro- problem to do rates to somebody else. So Bell Labs being Bell Labs said, ask MIT, why don't you come up with a language that would be suitable for uh, our accounting people, our marketing people? So MIT came up with a program called Smalltalk, which was, was uh, directed at three-year-olds. Mm-hmm. Which I didn't know that had- was directed at, okay, that's fascinating. It only had blocks and diagrams and actors and people on a stage. And uh, of course, the small talk language was picked up by, by two fairly famous uh, organizations, Microsoft and Apple, and became Windows. But that's where the Windows idea originated. So I, yeah, I did not know that, that piece of the history. That's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. So, so it means, I mean, since, since these languages that we're using today were developed for three-year-olds, it, it goes without saying that if course they can they have access to it because mm-hmm. all you're talking about are are uh, building blocks uh, just b- blocks and legos and things well here's a slightly different take on the question that john just asked um i'm hearing you talk about people who might get very bad grades on tests but learned a lot people yes. who might not have been able to have the time the energy to put into these things, but because of this way of thinking, became much more able to learn in general and maybe learn the topic even better than other people. So that gets me wondering from the question that was just asked from the audience, how do we know who the people who have learned the most from this are? Like, how can we identify the people who have become the most able to be great mathematicians, great physicists from this style of education. And to rephrase the question as well a little bit, you know, as we're talking about, if the learning outcome of the test isn't actually the appropriate learning outcome, how do you think about learning outcomes, right? So what, what's the equivalent of having that, the reader that you're, you know, showing that you had uh, the capacity to learn? How do you implement that at scale or let, like at the scale of a university or something like that? So I'll go back to my Montessori experience. Heck yeah. The Montessori experience is that you make kids accountable and responsible for certain things. They're accountable for getting their meals. They're accountable for uh, uh, if they're going to pick up some uh, some toy, uh, then they're, they have to take it to their space and play with it. And if they're done with it, they have to take it back. So they, they there's this level of accountability and if they play with it, it goes without saying they're actually learning. Sure. Mm-hmm. And all you're really testing in, in reality in any of these tests 
is their ability to be accountable. Did they actually spend the time on it that they were supposed to? And in my view, the question is, who's, who's going to be accountable, the teacher or the students? And so my goal, I think, if I had my own way, is to always make the student accountable. Just like in industry, I always make the employees accountable, not the manager. Mm -hmm. That you, you ask people, you know, at the beginning of the quarter, I ask people, how many people are going to show up? Okay. You can raise your hand. Once you raise your hand, then, then you're committed. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't raise your hand, that's okay too. So it sort of comes down to the contract you were talking about. Your it's a contract. People, you can tell the people who have the aptitude because they do what they set out to do. Correct. And so when you're now implementing people picking projects and having, you know, a, a project-based component of their learning, how, how has that evolved since, you know, because originally apparently there was a concern that, oh, this is too open-ended, if, if you didn't agree with that. But so what, what's the what's the current incarnation of, of project learning in, in your teaching? Well, um, when I teach courses designed by others, I have to kind of follow their rules. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And their rules are, um, they have a certain set of outcomes that, that um, are required. And um, I don't really have the opportunity to give the students the flexibility to, to make their own choices. Mm. I mean, I can't pass a student who says, yep, I heard you. I, 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 I'm not going to do anything in this course. I'm going to sit and listen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I would probably be okay with that in, in, in the abstract, but, um, uh, but when, when a student is paid a certain amount of tuition and hmm. faculty members are paid a certain amount of salary, uh, 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 they're very nervous about this, this kind of loose way of, of behaving. Sure. Now, uh, if this isn't changing the, the subject too abruptly, um, you know, speaking of lifelong learning, uh, you, you also have an interest in maritime history and are involved with the, the Chicago Maritime Museum. Um, would, would you like to talk about uh, how, how did that interest come about? Uh, you know, is that connected with the story of game theory and physics and, and management or is, how did those threads come together? Well, um, I have always been interested in, in, in certain kinds of physical sports. And uh, when I was a student, I was a rock climber and, and uh, my friend, my costerless at Oxford was a rock climber. That was a common interest. Um, one of my other interests is, is sailing, and I got interested in sailing as a, a, a graduate student. Somebody came to my door and said, I, I need five people for crew uh, on a, for a sailboat race. And I said, sure, what's a sailboat race and what's a crew? Yeah. Uh, I've been sailing for a long, long time. And because I got in, involved with the sailing community, I ultimately got involved with people that were associated with the Maritime Museum. And mm. um uh, because of my involvement in the sailing community, they asked me to help out with uh, um, being on a nominating committee for the museum, which I did. And I got some people on the board and, and they got mad at me and said, okay, in, in, in retaliation, we're putting you on the board. <laughs> 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 there's, there's nothing like, uh, you know, giving someone responsibilities to make them want to do it to you yeah. back. So, so I've been doing that for about 20 years and we've, we've gone from, from a storage area to, to a, a, a bricks and mortar museum in Chicago. Mm. And, uh, we, we raised about a hundred thousand dollars last year, uh, uh as, as part of our fundraising campaign. And, um, we have lots of exhibits and we're trying to build new exhibits and, um, uh, the overlap, of course, is A, it has to do with physics because I love the sailing part. It has a lot to do with physics. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the strategy. I see the strategic ideas played out in the real world now. Mm -hmm. is, is there a particular exhibit you think is very cool in terms of, uh, you know, an example of strategic thinking that, that people might be able to, to learn from? I don't have one off the top of my head. Sure, no problem. So good, it's, it's a good question though. I'll have to yeah. think about it. Sure. So uh, 
I do want to be sensitive to, to your time commitment. So uh, I, I want to make sure that if you're in the audience currently live and you have any questions that you've been holding off on, please be sure to you know, put them in now because we want to make sure that we get to any of your questions as well. Uh, and then know if there's any other questions that you, you've been uh, eager to ask as well. I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for, for Q&A, assuming that you also have time to, to stay with us for a moment, Jerry. And, and thank you for staying a half an hour yeah, past so our expected time already. But I actually, I do have an answer to your question about our exhibit. Okay, oh, great. <laughs> not, not that I've had a chance to think about it. Um, one of the strategic choices was why you build a, a, a city in Chicago in the first place. Mm. Yes, that is a that is a very, you know, uh, fascinating area of study is how, how do we wind up with the population centers that we do? Okay, so there, there's an exhibit related to this. And so there's an exhibit of, of how did that come about over time, starting with uh, the indigenous population using this mm -hmm. as a, a portage area uh, to all the way through people like Daniel Burnham, who uh, uh, helped create uh, the recreational aspects of Chicago. Uh, other people that, because it was a portage area, saw the, the possibility of it being a, a, a trade center. And at one mm -hmm. point, Chicago had uh, uh, the largest uh, uh, amount of, of cargo shipped into the city by, by water in the world, even though it's an inland port. And most people don't know that for a long time, Chicago had 12 miles of dock space. Yeah. So very much, uh, so many, many strategic issues uh, and sort of game theory issues of people coming together, making hard decisions. Now, th this might be a little bit too detailed of a question, uh, you know, this, this late in the conversation, but uh, what is there interesting to say about the emergent versus intentional aspects of that, that strategic decision process that happens? Because you're talking about a process that played out over a very, very long time span involving many, many, many people and these sorts of things. So when we're thinking about emergence versus intentional uh, behaviors, is there anything interesting to say in a brief time about that? Um, well, I, I will quote something out of physics, okay? Because in physics, we have, we, we have things called chaotic behaviors, which in, in essence are emergent. Mm -hmm. uh, these are attributes of the computational nature of the, the equations. And they play out because the equations are not linear and therefore the effects aren't always what you expected. Mm. And to the extent that, that game theory is itself a set of complex equations that are computationally accessible, you would in fact expect and also do see emergent type behaviors. Um, uh, one example might be, um, uh, Kaidi, one of the, the economists pointed out the boom and bust cycles sure. over the centuries. Uh, in a sense, that's an emergent type of behavior. It's not easy to explain from the day-to-day -day operation, but why does it happen so regularly? Mm -hmm. And that's that's probably an example of the, um, that behavior is an indicator of the underlying complexity. So you can find complexity in, in many places if you uh, care to look. So uh, they're all there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, reminder again, uh, if you're joining us, please feel free to put questions into the chat. And uh, Noah, did you have any other questions that you wanted to, to get to? More of a comment that I just wanted to say, it seems like your philosophy of education and also the way that you've lived your life is wonderfully coherent in its incoherence in saying that you need to be who you are. You need to see the world in a way that lets you think, really come to understand it, understand where you don't understand, and then pursue what you're interested in and know that what you're interested in could change. Mm. I, I think that is tied in very much with the philosophy behind which the technology that we're working with here at Wolfram is, is built around the idea of saying, 
we're not just here for one thing, any of us. And that the way we think and the tools we use should not push that sort of agenda. I would just expand that a little bit because I think you're absolutely right on. I would say that the way to teach is a student has many, many possibilities. And a good way to teach is to allow them to, to uh, create those possibilities, which only they know about, mm -hmm. as opposed to you telling them what they should do, which is very limiting. So a technology like the Wolfram technology that, that, that doesn't put any structures on what you have to know, more than just what how to frame your questions carefully, is an ideal structure for pulling out uh, the genius that every student has. Like Feynman says, uh, he talks about any fool can learn calculus, which he was uh, suggesting it was himself. Mm -hmm. Any fool can, can learn quantum electrodynamics. What he was really saying is he's a fool and he did it and he learned it. And therefore anybody else can do it. It won't necessarily be what he did, but it will be something very specific to what's in each person. That's a beautiful idea that you, you want to let the students create their own possibilities. Um, I don't think I've ever heard that particular thought put so succinctly, but I think that sums up a large body of philosophy um, in sort of modern education. Um, we did get a question. We do, which is related to uh, you know advice for teachers. So that that general thought, I think, is beautiful advice for teachers, and I would I would echo that. Um, although I wouldn't have thought to say it so nicely. Um, so the, the more specific question is: uh, so do games seem uh, more effective for younger students, or how would you implement teaching using games with older students? And I have some thoughts about this as well. But so what what do you think in terms of uh, you know? What, what games do you use to teach students some of these basic strategic ideas? I, well, I usually start off with the simplest game I can think of, which is tic-tac-toe. Mm -hmm. uh, because that has, that's such a low common denominator. Mm -hmm. And it's a very complicated game, actually, oh, yes. uh, to analyze. But... Uh, but in terms of getting the basic ideas across, it's very simple. So your, your basic idea would be that the simpler the game, the better, no matter the age of the student. Yeah. I, yeah. The, what, the way I learned physics was always to start off in a new subject with, with a book that's written for like a fourth or fifth grader. Mm -hmm. I believe it was Einstein had an interesting quote about you want to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. So you want to find a game or a phenomena or a possibility right. that these students are creating, which is rich, but also the the sort of minimal interesting case. Um, the other thing I think that, that that was behind what people like Einstein have said is if you look at anything long enough in a you will, there, there will be something of interest in it. Oh, yeah. So no matter how simple you think the game is, mm -hmm. it probably isn't. And therefore, mm -hmm. it probably is okay, which supports the idea of let the, the student come up with their own game. Mm -hmm. In fact, in some cases, the simpler something is, the more you have to think about it. When I was teaching discrete mathematics, I loved putting up on the board in the first day, two plus three equals and i'd ask them and i'd say this isn't a trick question what's the answer and they'd say five and i said great prove it <laughs> yeah <laughs> that that the the more obvious a fact is sometimes the more deeply you have to think about it to fully understand it yeah i, I remember asking my daughter when she was like five to to count the different ways you could some numbers up to a, a number like five, you know, one mm -hmm. plus one plus one plus one plus one or two sure. plus three. And, and so, uh, so for each number, how many different ways are there? So it's really easy to formulate that problem so that everybody understands. That's a hard problem in math. <laughs> mm. So you've already had, well, more than a few great, great pieces of advice for teachers, but is there any other advice that you would give for teachers? 
Um, well, here's one that they're not going to like is Uh-oh. no grade, no grades, mm-hmm. no grades. I, I actually Which is also a very Montessori idea. I, I, I wholeheartedly yes. support that. Uh, I, I it was uh, the good fortune of uh, being at uh, at least one institution that that was uh, very much in favor of uh, uh, you know measuring what skills were people growing rather than what their particular grade was. Um, so can you explain your rationale behind that? Why no grades? Because uh, you sort of already alluded to it is this is again from Montessori that everybody develops skills at their own rate. Mm -hmm. So somebody might develop very good quantitative skills at the age of two or three, but their, their reading skills might be very, very poor until they're like 10 or 11. Um, So to grade them uniformly on everything that you think they should know at each age means that they're going to fail at some things despite the fact that they're just not ready or interested in it yet. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that but, someone who's the greatest success in the world in one area is probably a terrible failure in something else. They sort of have to be. And grades make those people feel like failures. Or I, I think what Montessori says is that if you let them go at their own rate, if it's important for them, they'll learn it. Mm-hmm. When it's important for them. Now, uh, here, here's a question that uh, I know a lot of students sometimes struggle with, right? Because a lot of times uh, it feels like there there are consequences which get into uh, you know making it harder to to follow Churchill's advice to define success as not losing enthusiasm after failure after failure after failure. So what, what skill or skill area would you say personally for you was the sort of the most painful to develop as you were going on? Um, I don't know if it was painful, but I can tell you that was one of the last skills I learned, which was I was really interested in reading. I read a lot of science fiction mm-hmm. and, 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 and I read a lot of math and, and science books, but in writing, my writing skills were abominable. Mm. Yeah. And, and I would say um, my speaking skills were, were pretty good. I was uh, in a debate squad in high school. But if you asked me to write something, it was really not very good at all. Um, I, I, my first exposure to a teacher that made literature interesting was in the 10th grade. Mm. And, and what was interesting is the teacher brought in some books that – she thought would be interesting, but were not allowed in school. And in retrospect, I'm not sure why, but one was a great expectations and the other was crime and punishment. Mm. And so she bought them on her own dime and, and handed them out and taught us how to read them. And mm-hmm. I, what was fascinating was her technique for reading a book was, that, that was complicated, like crime and punishment, was to write all over it, is to first of all, in the in the, the front page, write the name of every person in the page in which they showed mm-hmm. up. Mm. To, when you were trying to keep motivated in order to, and, and this might actually not be when you were younger, this might be, you know, sometime when you were further along in your career, what mental toolkit do you use to stay motivated when a project gets really hard? Um, my, my fallback position for getting motivated mm-hmm. since I was a kid was I would just go work math problems mm. and, and, and it, that had nothing to do with anything. And I would just turn off my brain about whatever I was supposed to uh, deliver. Mm-hmm. And that you and, had sort of a recharge with batteries charged by math. problems. Yeah. And, um, what I learned later was a better way to do that, um, uh, a, a more systematic way to make sure that your batteries never run out, which is mm. learn how to pull a problem closed. Mm. So being able to say, I am done with this problem for yeah. now, which which is really what I was trying to do when I did the math problems. I was trying to say, I'm done with the other stuff. This is a more deterministic way of saying, 
there's something I'm supposed to do. I'm going to just declare I'm done with that problem and I'm not going to do any more on it. And I'm going to be mm. okay with that. Mm. That is a really important skill to highlight, actually. I'm, I'm glad that uh, you, you shared that with us. Thank you. And that was, that I learned that was from uh, my, my course on how to be a better manager. Ah, great. So that was a, that, and I, and, and they also gave me the, the, uh, um, a better understanding of failure as what's missing as opposed to an emotional roadblock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Jerry, I wanted to thank you very, very much for joining us, especially so, so long after uh, our, our initial you know, length that we had told you. So I, I appreciate that deeply. Thank you. I, I hope I haven't worn the socks off of you. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I, I could probably keep going for another several hours because, in fact, I think we'll have to have you back at some point because, uh, you know, this is this has been fantastic. Now, well, it's uh, been fun for me, too. Great. Now, but before we, we say goodbye for now, uh, wh where can people find more things? So we mentioned decision process theory. We mentioned all, all sorts of interesting things. Uh, Chicago Maritime Museum. Where, where should people go if they want to? Uh, find uh, more about the interesting things that we've only just started to scratch the surface of. Um, I do have a, a website and I have some books which you can find online at Amazon mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and a couple of Wolfram books that go into detail and provide a sort of a, a course of study of how to do the game theory. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm currently going to teach a course on game theory uh, in the spring uh, using uh, the Wolfram books and Wolfram notebooks. Well, I, I can confidently say that your students are in good hands. So uh, hello <laughs> to any of them who might see this at a later date. <laughs> okay. And, and for all the faculty members, I'm sorry, I, 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 I told off on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be curious to see what, what you might have gotten, your trouble, uh, gotten yourself in trouble over. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should let that stop a good conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, Professor Jerry Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for, for joining us for this wonderful conversation. Uh, until next time, we will see you again. <laughs>